first of all, at this session, we're going to hear from Daniela. I've come across Daniela quite a bit before because of her very, very interesting work around the operation of central banks um, and the governance of those banks. She's been working closely with our shadow treasury team in the Labour Party and it's really fantastic that she's going to be talking to us about the international financial system. She's then going to be followed by Kavaljeet um, who has joined us all the way from New Delhi. I said to him, are you doing anything else while you're here? And he said, no, I'm here for this conference. So we're really, really lucky to have you. Thank you. <laughs> Um, and as well as running a think tank um, in, uh, uh, in New Delhi, um, Madhyam, um, he's also published widely on many of the topics that I'm sure he's going to talk about, about fixing global finance and also rethinking bilateral investment treaties as well, a very important part of the global financial architecture. Um, we then have Anne Petifor, who I'm sure many people in this room will know very well because she for a long time was almost a lone voice actually in the wilderness warning about the um, onset of the global financial crisis um, and she's been a very powerful voice advocating for um, a very different approach to be taken to financial markets and for the redesign of the global financial system. And then finally, last but not least, we will have John um, Christensen. Um, who I've known of for many, many years because of his um, extremely hard work and dedicated work against tax dodging and money laundering, um, coming out of the, the heart of the beast, some might say, in some respect, um, uh, of, uh, having formerly been an economic advisor to the government of Jersey, but now um, I think one of the really authoritative voices um, uh, talking about uh, what we can do um, to reform the international tax system um, and to stop it being abused by those who essentially want to steal resources from uh, poor people and those without resources. Um, so thank you very, very much to all of you. Our speakers are going to have 10 minutes, stretch to 12, if they really have something burning to get out, and then we're going to have enough time for questions at the end. So, Daniela, thank you very much. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, yes thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, the brief for this session was to speak about uh, uh, the reform of international financial institutions and the international financial architecture and the relationship with the nation state. And I thought I should frame my interventions uh, in a way that is quite fam through a question that is quite familiar to the Labour Party and is quite familiar to, to the UK. If there is going to be a progressive government, should they leave the IFIs, the World Bank and the IMF, or should they stay uh, and reform? And as a Romanian migrant in the UK, I, I come uh, on the side of remain. Uh, having said that, in this case, the arguments for remaining and reforming the international financial institutions have to do, uh, I will argue, with a very careful diagnostic of where we are now in international development discourse. And where we are now, it's quite an interesting moment, and I want to convince you that there is a new paradigm uh, sort of emerging in international development. Uh, and I want to show you a short clip. I'm going to dedicate two minutes of my speech to the World Bank, uh, or to give two minutes of my speech to the World Bank. Um, let's see if it works to sort of frame where we are now in, in the IFIs, or what the IFIs are doing at the moment. Let's see if it works. Uh... Okay, work with me here. Ending extreme poverty worldwide will take some $4 trillion a year. Development aid is only 330 million. Another one trillion comes from remittances, philanthropy, and some other sources. So we're short, about three trillion a year short. Seems like a really big problem. Developing countries are a $12 trillion market opportunity. Opportunities in everything, actually. Hey, challenge, just found your opportunity. So besides investors, who would it help? These people to live a healthy life this man in getting a good income or give this woman a chance to create something incredible and everyone else in developing and developed countries alike it's not just about getting private sector money into development 
It's a process about when to use it, when to use public money, insurance, guarantees, or some combination that best fits. Not to replace development aid, but complement it. The World Bank Group and other development banks have the expertise to help private finance tap into developing markets, not just to invest in infrastructure projects, but in people. We call it maximizing finance for development. A little wonky, we know. And while developing countries are doing their part, it's just not going to be enough. That's why we need to rethink financing development so this little one has a healthy life. And this woman can disrupt an industry with her product idea. And this youth, her big idea can change the world. In the end, we get strong markets and strong communities. I'm sorry if I'm going to stop it here. Uh, in this audience, it's clear uh, uh, where, where this is heading to. Uh, this is a video produced in 2017. It marked a new stage in the uh, development paradigm that is promoted by the IMF and the World Bank. This development paradigm is called Maximizing Finance for Development, and it basically relies on the idea or it promotes the idea that poverty, inequality, and the climate crisis could be sorted out if we get uh, global institutional investors who are sitting on trillions and trillions of cash into development projects. And I call this paradigm the Wall Street consensus to remind us that we are coming in international development from the Wall Street consensus and the Washington consensus. And this Washington consensus basically argued that if you get markets involved into um, uh, the allocation of resources, if you neutralize the state, everything will get better. Now, we know how that went, uh, and what the Wall Street consensus is doing now is reimagining uh, international development, and I will argue that it's reimagining international development in a very interesting and potentially, to my mind, as a progressive economist, very dangerous way, in that it's proposing to reimagine the state. The state reappears in the Wall Street consensus, and I will show you that I think the state will have the role of de-risking uh, development projects for in, uh, institutional investors. In other words, public resources will be put to use in order to uh, subsidize from the Global South uh, my pension fund, among other things. And although, to my doubts, uh, I think me as a, as a person who has a pension fund contribution is what is described in the finance space a uh, dump money because I'm not going to see any of these uh, benefits. So the de-risking state is a, the response that financial capitalism, and we know capitalism is very good at designing new types of responses in, uh, when it's faced with crisis, and this um, de-risking state is the response of financial capitalism to the impending climate crisis. Uh, and what is that response? It seeks to enlist the state into creating in, uh, and de-risking new types of asset classes that basically mean privatizing public services in, and you saw the World Bank already gave you a list of what they're planning to privatize, all the way from infrastructure, broadly understood the social infrastructure, to health, to transportation, to everything you can, you can think of. And this is also sold, and, and perhaps in some ways quite more outrageous, it's sold as uh, delivering on the sustainable development goals. So the idea is, and the narrative, I, I urge you to go and look at the World Bank website, is that if we sell SDGs to institutional investors, and many of them have already started to work on this, uh, by in, uh, enlisting the state in the risking for institutional investors, then everything will be okay. Uh, what do I mean by this de-risking state and, and what, uh, sorry, before we go to that, just uh, like in the Washington consensus and the famous paper that John Williamson wrote describing who are the political coalitions behind the Washington consensus, it's important to know who's promoting this Wall Street consensus. And we have there uh, from uh, academics and sort of uh, intellectual elites in the G20 eminent persons group. We have the G20 who for a couple of years now has a new pro uh, project called infrastructure as an asset class where it's putting in place some of these uh, um, uh, measures in order to transform uh, infrastructure in the global south into investable uh, opportunities. 
it, it has the World Bank, the IMF, and other multilateral development banks. Basically, everybody is in that space. It has very important global institutional investors. And BlackRock, I, I'm giving you this as an example, both of my Twitter activity, uh, and uh, the importance of BlackRock in this space. Last year in Bali, uh, Indonesia hosted the IMF World Bank annual meetings, and uh, the um, company or the, the investor that was hosting the uh, dinner of the governors of the central bank on the last evening was BlackRock. And BlackRock is very important in promoting this Wall Street consensus and this maximizing finance for development agenda. The G20 is already uh, involved in, in implementing some of uh, uh, these policies through infrastructure as an asset class. So Basically, there is a new constellation of political actors that go from the national level to the international level that are trying to put uh, in place the new uh, architecture of uh, the Wall Street consensus. Uh, why is this a problem? Uh, I think uh, going through some of the documents that have been produced uh, by the Maximizing Finance for Development uh, project, uh, this, this uh, 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 Wall Street consensus is trying to redirect public spending in the global south towards uh, uh, de-risking uh, um, assets for institutional investors, and that goes from moving as much as, the, the, um, as much as possible of the new constructions in infrastructures towards public-private partnerships and uh, imposing user fee uh, access for public services from health to education to, to roads. Uh, in the G20 now in Japan, there were lots of discussions of how to make sure that governments are going to write in their PPP contracts to de-risk for fluctuations in demand for these user-based services. So if basically uh, there is not enough traffic on a road that has tolls, then the government will have to pay the institutional investors that have bought the bonds which are financing this road. The government will also have to compensate investors if any future government that, has, that is progressive will for, will, for example, implement new labor registration, like uh, an increase in the minimum wage, uh, wage. Investors say, this is not my problem. If the government wants to implement uh, better labor legislation, they should pay for it. Uh, probably, in some ways, more important, uh, institutional investors are organizing themselves through this Wall Street consensus in order to deal with a, a unavoidable regulation that is coming to come in the financial sector in order to deal with the cri climate crisis. And if you listen to Mark Carney, the head of the um, Bank of England, he, he regularly describes the, the importance of dealing with climate change as a financial stability issue. And when he dis the, discusses climate change and climate risks for the financial sector, he identifies two types of risk. One are the physical risks that come from a flooding or, or uh, extreme climate events, and the other one are transition risks. And these are very important in the political economy of understanding what's happening now, because transition risks refer to the, the, the possible ways in which the profitability of the financial system will be affected by regulation put in place to deal with climate change. And what institutional investors are expecting is that if governments want want to regulate us for, for climate change, to force us, for example, to invest in low carbon activities, then they should pay for it and they should compensate us for uh, the, those risks. I won't bore you with the te complicated technical details of finance, but uh, uh, these institutional investors are also expecting uh, uh, countries in the global south to completely re-engineer the financial system so it's easy for institutional investors to come in and out uh, of these uh, 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 financial systems. This is a very quick example. I don't have time to elaborate. I don't know how many minutes did you show me there because I'm a bit short-sighted. Excellent. So in two minutes, very quickly, if you, I, I've read a lot of very boring documents called infrastructure. Um, the World Bank is producing now over the last two or three years uh, documents that are uh, sort of materializing the maximizing finance for development agenda and they're called energy infrastructure uh, structural adjust, uh, um, sorry, infrastructure um, assessments. And in this uh, energy infrastructural assessments or energy infra subs, you have these measures that I described as a de-risking state. And I just want to mention one that, uh, that uh, is, I thought it was very interesting. In Egypt, for the Egypt infrastructure 
program, the World Bank is advising the Egyptian government to redirect their national investment bank activities away from uh, financing industrial policy strategies towards uh, uh, de-risking um, the uh, new asset classes for institutional investors. So uh, the, the development bank no longer does what it used to do in the old developmental state, but it basically works for uh, uh, global institutional investors to receive sub subsidies for, for the global south. Uh, very quickly, and I'm finishing with this, if we leave, if the UK would leave the IFIs, the international financial institutions, and try to set up new institutional arrangements, my worry is that, it, that if the UK leaves, the city stays within this Wall Street consensus, and the financial system stays, and the British financial system stays within the system, and it basically abandons in some ways uh, the global south to the dynamics of financial capitalism. So I will stay with this. What does Remain and Reform look like when we're talking about IFIs? Uh, it means first recognizing that we are in a new stage of financial capitalism as, as far as international development is concerned, and that is a stage where Wall Street is promising to deliver on the SDG priorities. In order to challenge that, it is important to try to <clears throat> enable and coordinate and think through what does a green developmental state look like. That is a developmental state that is reorienting uh, the allocation of resources towards low carbon sectors and towards a just transition to a low carbon economy where it's not the poor either here or in the global south that, they, that have to pay for it. Thank you and sorry. <laughs> Yeah, that was a terrific breakneck and very helpful, I think, explanation of the Wall Street consensus and how we can challenge it. Very much appreciated. I think if we move on now to Kavaljit and uh, hear your thoughts, that would be fantastic. Um, First of all, let me thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to share my perspective on uh, the global financial issues. Friends, uh, now more than 10 years have passed since the eruption of global financial crisis in 2008. And uh, yet, the crisis is not fully over. Yeah, yeah. There are several Eurozone uh, economies which are still grappling with the after effects of the second phase of the global financial crisis, which started in 2010 in the form of a sovereign debt crisis in the Eurozone uh, economies. Mark Carney has recently claimed that after the crisis, the global financial system is now stable, safer, simple, fairer, and inclusive than 10 years ago. I don't think that's the correct picture. I think the global financial system is still fragile, and it is not strong enough to deal with even such as a no-deal Brexit or a prolonged uh, trade war. My biggest concern is that the fault lines which created the 2008 financial crisis, th those fault lines have not been addressed adequately, while the new fault lines have emerged after the, after the crisis. There is no denying that some regulatory reforms in the banking sector have been introduced after the crisis. But they are not adequate to deal with the challenges which we are facing today. And what is worrisome is that the political commitment on the regulatory reform is waning. Nowadays, there is a reform fatigue. In the US, opposite is happening. You know, the deregulation agenda is back in the US. The regulatory reforms are being rolled back in the US. Once the U.S. rolls back regulatory reforms, other countries may also would like to ref roll back these reforms in order to maintain a competitive financial sector. And when that happens, there would be a race to the bottom, increasing the risk of another financial crisis. Post-crisis, we saw the revival of G20, but we are finding that G20 is increasingly becoming a talking shop. It lacks the political will and the consensus to address fundamental financial reforms. Many of us have been demanding for a long time that the IMF and the World Bank should be reformed and restructured. And many of us, I think many of you also, have been part of such campaigns. And we have given concrete proposals how to go about it. But we find that the developed countries are absolutely not interested in implementing these uh, reforms. So broadly speaking, as of today, you know, we, when it comes to financial issues, we have two basic demands. First. We need financial stability because it's a public good. Second, we need a financial sector which serves the real economy and works for all. Now, both these demands are reasonable and doable. 
there are many financial issues which require our attention, but uh, due to time uh, limit, I will stick to five issues which require our immediate attention and intervention. First, I think we need to address two big to fail banks, which are also known as CIFIs. Not only these big banks are alive after the crisis, but they have become much bigger uh, than, 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 to, uh, the, than before. And the regulatory framework of the, on, on these uh, too big to fail banks was prepared by Financial Stability Board way back in 2010. And G20 uh, approved that in 2011. That regulatory framework is supposed to be fully implemented by the end of this year. But we find that very little progress has been made to implement these reforms. Why? Because of the huge, intense lobbying by the big banks. So the CFIs, the uh, too, uh, too big to fail banks, they are still posing a risk to our financial stability. Second, I think we need to focus our attention to the shadow banking sector, which is lightly regulated across the world. After the crisis, we are finding that a lot of risky banking activities have migrated from the main banking sector to the shadow banking sector. And the problem is that these shadow banks don't operate in isolation. They are highly interconnected with the rest of the banking system and the financial system. So if something goes wrong in the shadow banks, it will immediately affect uh, the entire financial sector. Currently in India, shadow banks are facing a liquidity crisis. And some shadow banks are also facing a solvency crisis. And the danger is that it could engulf the entire banking system, the entire financial system of India. Why? Because shadow banks have borrowed huge amount of money from banks, from pension funds, from mutual funds and insurance company. And we all know that the global financial crisis of 2008 originated not in the main banking sector of the US. It originated in the shadow banking sector of the US. At that time, the US shadow banks were dealing with the housing markets. Now, they are dealing with risky leveraged loans. And the concern is that if tomorrow the financial cycle turns, these loans could default and thereby they could pose a direct threat to the pension funds and the insurance companies who are holding these risky loans. So we need to be concerned about the shadow banking sector. On banks, we have some global regulatory standards, like we have Basel III norms now. But when it comes to shadow banks, there are no regulatory global norms. Third issue is that we need to regulate short-term speculative volatile capital flows. And this is a very big issue for the poor and developing countries who receive such financial flows. And I don't think that the global safety nets which are there are adequate to deal with such volatile capital flows. The safety nets are patchy and they are getting further and further fragmented. We all know that the many countries avoid the IMF loan because of the strict conditionalities imposed by the IMF. Some countries have recently used bilateral currency swap ag agreements, but these agreements are driven more by the geopolitical interests. So for a number of poor and developing countries, they have only two options. One is self-insurance through accumulating large foreign exchange reserves, but it's a very costly option. The other option is to use capital controls. I think the recipient countries should proactively use capital controls along with macroprudential measures to maintain financial stability. And if, if need be, these countries should roll back uh, those bilateral investment treaties and uh, free trade agreements that prohibit the use of capital controls. I also think that the source countries, the developed countries, should also have some responsibility in regulating these financial flows at their end. Ideally, we should have a global coordination between the source countries and the uh, recipient countries to regulate these uh, such uh, destabilizing financial flows. But unfortunately, that is not happening. Now I come to the next issue. I think we should be also concerned about the domination of the US dollar in the global payment system. The US dollar, we all know that is the global reserve currency, something like 62% of the global currency reserves are in the US dollars. Then we have commodities like oil, gas. These are priced in US dollars, not in euros or yen or any other currency. Now that gives tremendous economic powers to the US and, how use, uh, and the, the US uses the dollar as a weapon by imposing sanction against those countries with whom it has political or strategic differences. So this is nothing but financial warfare. And to stop this financial warfare, I think we need multipolar payment system. And we should also de-dollarize the bilateral trade. 
you know, when countries like India and Bangladesh, or let's say countries like uh, uh, Indonesia and Malaysia, when they do bilateral trade, they, they usually trade in US dollars. But my point is that they should also use their own currencies. When they are when they are conducting such, such bilateral trade, now I come to the last issue, which is that we need a financial sector that serves the real economy and works for all. And this is not not a new idea. You know, this is what Occupy Wall Street and many progressive movements across the world have been saying. They are saying that we are not per se against the finance, but we want that the finance should work for everyone, yes. not for 10 percent or the tiny one percent. Now, finance for all is feasible. It can be achieved through regulation. It can also be achieved through public banking. And public banking is not a new concept. You know, we used to have public banks across the world in the form of national development banks and uh, in some countries, state-owned commercial banks. However, under the, uh, the new liberal economic reforms and Washington consensus, these banks were, were privatized and their role declined. But now the Washington consensus is dead and the intellectual climate is changing. I think the progressive movement should size upon this opportunity and demand a greater role for public banking. And let me make it very clear here, when I am advocating public banking, I'm not suggesting that the entire banking sector of our country should be nationalized. Rather, what we need is a banking sector with diverse ownership, pursuing different business models, serving different clients. So, which means there is a role for public banks in our economies, there is a role for private banks. And I would also argue that there is a role for cooperative banks, community banks, and local banks. And this is not a utopia which I'm talking about. You know, in countries like Germany and uh, India, you have such a banking system with diverse ownership, and it's functioning. And if our governments can spend trillions of dollars uh, to rescue private banks, I think they can also spend a few millions uh, of dollars to set up public banks. And the 2008 crisis has done one positive thing. You know, I, I really appreciate that. That is, it has demolished the myth that the private banks are more efficient than the, uh, than the public banks. You know. In India and many other countries, the empirical evidence shows that the bank ownership has no definite relationship with efficiency. In India, to give you an example, we have the most efficient banks in both public and private sector. In India, we also have the most inefficient banks in both public and private sector. So the point I wish to make is that the bank efficiency has nothing to do with the ownership. I think we need to reimagine the role of public banking in the 21st century. Because in the 20th century, public banks were largely addressing the credit market failures. But in the 21st century, in my view, their role could be much bigger. They have the potential to tackle big societal challenges, such as climate change, food security, inequality, and inclusive growth. So I'll conclude by saying that we need a bottom-up approach to build public banking at the local, national, and even at the global level. At the same time, we also need a top-down approach to regulate finance at the global and national level. And we need both approaches, and they are not mutually exclusive. In fact, they complement each other. And the main hurdles, in my view, on finance issues are political. They are not technical in nature. If we have strong movements, grassroots movements, and progressive polity, we can democratize and regulate finance at all levels. I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kavalji. That was really fantastic and very, very disciplined as well. And I think people's ears will be ringing and pens will have been writing down very, very quickly your five areas for reform. We'll now pass on to Anne. Thank you very, Thank much. You very much. And um, first of all, I want to say how happy I was to come this morning and hear the speeches that were made through the lens effectively of anti-imperialism. And... Um, I, found, I want to congratulate John and Costas for, for lining that up and for beginning that conference with that theme, this conference with that theme. And I want to say something which may not be directly relevant uh, and may sound Brexiterish, but we in Britain, Brex, yeah, Brexitish, sorry, but we in Britain at the moment are at a historic, a pivotal historic moment, right? Boris Johnson, who is likely to become our Prime Minister very soon, is the Neville Chamberlain of our time. 
and he is appeasing, he is appeasing a very powerful militarized state. While Neville Chamberlain appeased a powerful and militarized state, that state was not as powerful as the one that is currently uh, under the presidency of one Donald Trump. And Boris Johnson sees his role as appeasing the right wing of the Republican Party and therefore of American imperialism. And I think we really, as a labor movement, have to get clear about that and have to make that case. And I say that for several reasons. So following on from what the speaker has just said, because while Germany was a powerful militarized state, Germany did not have the power of the United States dollar. What we are seeing today is a globalized, financialized, dollarized system which uses the dollar to enforce imperial power. We're seeing it happen in Iran. We see it around the world where the dollar is being used by the United States to subordinate states to the interests of the United States of America. And for me, that is a really important issue for us here in Britain to address. Now, I want to begin by just quoting Alan Greenspan, one of the people that, I, that is so revered um, by so many, one of the gods of the finance sector. He said, and this was early on uh, in the financial crisis, thanks to globalization, policy decisions in the United States have been largely replaced by global market forces. National security aside, billions of dollars on weaponry, it hardly makes any difference who will be the next president. The world is governed by market forces. It hardly makes any difference who will be the next president. And then there's another quote I want to give to you because I came across it recently, which I still, I think, also explains the dilemma that a Labour government is going to face. And it's from the World Trade Organization's 1998 annual report in which the World Trade Organization argues that there is a central government challenge, a central challenge to government of our time, of our global age. The fact, says the World Trade Organization, that governments answer mainly to national constituencies, while increasingly the economic system must, and I repeat, must answer to global needs. Now, I don't know what global needs are, but I'm saying to John McDonnell and to a Labour government, that's what the WTO says you must do. That in other words, it's not for you to be mainly answerable, answerable to national constituencies, but to global needs. Now, why is this relevant? And why is this particularly relevant to the Labour Party? I want to tell you why it's relevant today. And why? Because of what is happening to the government of Mexico. As we all know, Lopez Obrador, Obrador, Jeremy Corbyn's friend, is president. And this week, this week, the Financial Times wrote that his new budget, the draft 2020 budget, must be presented, said the Financial Times, by mid-September. Markets will be unforgiving if these documents signal further deviations from economic reality. The Mexican president can still turn around investor perceptions, but time is running short. That is a threat, right? That is a threat to the new government of Mexico. And we need to therefore understand that a Labour government is going to be entering a world governed by market forces. And in my view, the Labour government should be part of the process of dismantling what uh, Jayati this morning so eloquently described as the international financial architecture. Now, the international financial architecture, and I have no time to discuss this, is a big, big house that we all live in. But we didn't build it. It was built by the finance sector after President Nixon unilaterally dismantled the architecture that had been built at Bretton Woods after the Second World War. One Sunday night after a famous television show that all Americans were watching, he went on TV and announced that he was unilaterally dismantling the system. And the next day, his staff, the IMF said to his staff, well, you know, what are we going to do now if you're going to dismantle this system? He said, go away and think about a new system. 
and they went away and they've never thought of a new system. Ah, oh, they said, we've come, across a, we've come across something we can now use as an alternative system, and that is the US dollar bill. That can be the world's global reserve currency, and you can, instead of gold, bars of gold, <clears throat> I'm going to wave green bits of paper at you, and, and you should be happy. And de Gaulle in particular was unhappy with that. So we, don't, we live in a, in a house, a financial architecture that was built by finance. Now, it does feel, it does feel it's incredibly powerful, and I agree very much with the speaker about we need to bring, we need to transform that architecture and that capital controls is one of the ways to do it. But it feels like a vast task. It feels like it's a huge thing to do. It feels as if they are truly very powerful, and furthermore, as I've said, they're weaponized. But I think it's entirely possible, and the reason I'm so confident is because of experience in history, and in particular the history of the New Deal. And that's why I've just written this, by the way, the publishers taught me that I've got to sell my book. Um, and that's published in September. Um, you know, the New Deal was, people talk about the New Deal, and I heard this morning critiques of Keynes and so on, as being a story about, you know, a, a Roosevelt administration which taxed and spent, spent large sums of money and used the state and the government to transform the American economy and, and create jobs. And that's not really what the New Deal was about. In his inaugural speech, President um, Roosevelt spoke about the finance sector and about how discredited it was and how he was going to do something about that. And that night, it was a Saturday night, he sat down with his staff in the White House and he began unilaterally to dismantle the architecture, the, the, the international financial architecture that had been created by the bankers that was called the gold standard. And everybody had said, you can't possibly dismantle the gold standard. You know, it's been there forever. It is how the world operates ever since David Ricardo. And unilaterally, he began the process of dismantling it. He, he started to instruct Wall Street banks to hand over their gold to the Treasury. And he announced that the US dollar was no longer going to be based on an estimate, on a, on a pricing of gold, but that it was going to be based on the strength of the US economy. And the banks had therefore to hand over their gold, and then, and he was, we wanted to do that on the Sunday. And his staff said to him, you can't do this on a Sunday, it's a holy day. You'll have to wait till Monday. So on Monday, he closed the banks and he demanded that they hand over all their gold. And then he, on Tuesday, he went public and he told the public to hand over all their gold. And willingly, the public handed over their gold and they got, they got dollars in exchange. And that began to dismantle the process. The banking, the global banking community panicked and they demanded that an international conference be convened in the summer of 33 to reconstitute the dollar standard, the, the gold standard. And Roosevelt said, well, you can have a conference, but I'm not attending. Mm -hmm. And boom, that was the end of the gold standard. And by transforming the gold standard, by transforming the international financial architecture overnight, Roosevelt was freed to put government in the driving seat of economic policy, not Wall Street. Government began to call the shots, not Wall Street calling the shots. And that meant that he was able to raise the finance and to spend what was needed to spend to tackle unemployment and to uh, restore economic um, stability and, and, to, and prosperity to the people of the United States. And what is fascinating about the New Deal is that they were faced by an environmental crisis. It was a profound environmental crisis. It was the Dust Bowl, right? which had caused mass migration and, of course, it destroyed agricultural land and so on. Under Roosevelt, three billion trees were planted to deal with soil erosion and the de degradation of the land uh, under the Dust Bowl. There's lots that was wrong about Roosevelt's administration, and I'm not here to defend it to the T. It was, it was racist in many respects. It was... It, it, they excluded women, for example, from many of the important areas of work that were created. But his role in dismantling the international financial architecture and then supporting the creation of a new, more stable architecture, the Bretton Woods system, 
in my view, was heroic and a good example to us that this is possible. Two minutes, Anne. I'm done. Thank you very much. Goodness, well, I, I, I feel terrible if I somehow terminated that absolutely fabulous historical exegesis, which I think does really show us that change is possible. So yep. thank you. And that has fired us all up for our last speaker, John, who's going to talk to us about um, tax and other international challenges. Thank you. Thank you. Uh and, reference, and references this morning to anti-imperialism um, got me fired up as well. I'm, I'm currently reading a lot about the East India Company. Uh, and, and Yeah, exactly. Um, and, and, and so much about what I'm reading about, it's history through the 18th, 19th and 20th, uh, well, 18th, 19th century. It reminds me of the City of London, and I'm going to talk a lot about the City of London and its uh, empire of tax havens. Uh, for those of you who have seen the last film I co-produced called the spider's web, Britain's second empire. I see this as an imperialist project from word go. Um, and I also think, Anne, that frankly, uh, our Britain played a key role in undermining Bretton Woods, of course, because as early as 1956, you saw the emergence of this deregulated, detaxed, completely out of control economy known as the euro dollar market here in London. Um, so right from word go, Britain was taking an aggressive position to undermining the, 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 the world order which was negotiated at Bretton Woods and, and all in the name of capital market freedom. So I've, I'm going to say that deeply embedded in the global financial architecture uh, are this, 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 this whole ecosystem of tax havens and uh, secrecy jurisdictions and a global army of financial professionals who are engaged in undermining democracy, hollowing out national sovereignty, undermining regulation and the ability of progressive states to tax capital and to regulate capital. And they are del deliberately, purposefully, willfully driving a race to the bottom. And we as progressives have to address that point. Now, go back 10 years, and here you have a cast of G20 characters, I hope you all speak French, who are all committed to putting an end, whoops, who cut that one out? Putting an end to um, the uh, tax haven economy um, ahead of the London G20 meeting. And I want to award them collectively a junior achievement award. <laughs> um, be because um, they set up with some measures which were to begin with, actually could have done so much, they could have taken it so much further, automatic information exchange country by country. So many of the measures that we, civil society, were pushing, but at every level they degraded them to the point that in many cases they're quite irrelevant, frankly. And I think we need to flag that up. Since the, the global financial crisis, we've some, seen some limited progress, but by and large, the, the, the problem of the race to the bottom has in fact worsened. And this is the bad news. If you look at what all of the candidates for the Conservative Party leadership were saying three weeks ago, before we narrowed them down to two, all of them were committing to what you would essentially call a deepening of Britain's tax haven role, a deepening of Britain's secrecy jurisdiction role. <laughs> They call it Singapore upon the Thames model. Nothing to do with housing, nothing to do with education or health services. This is all about going further down a race to the bottom. And the race to the bottom isn't just a race to the bottom on tax and financial market regulation. They're talking about a race to the bottom on environmental regulation or environmental protections, um, labour market protections. In other words, a race to the bottom across the entire piece. And I think we need to seriously address uh, what that race to the bottom means. But essentially, Britain is a key player in what I think of as the, the tax termites, the, the, the termites that are undermining the ability of democratic states to actually raise money and spend money. Uh, and if you look at the, the first termite number one is, of course, the, termite, the, the tax haven economy. And Britain's at the core of it. All of those which are marked out in blue are essentially British territories. Um, 
<coughs> that's the top 20, the, 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 the worst offenders here. And these are the countries which deliberately shape their legislation, their regulation and so on, the entire compliance environment to enable multinational companies to evade and avoid tax. I, mean, I, I don't make any difference between the uh, distinction between the two. As far as I'm concerned, it's all abusive tax behaviour. Um, but this has become massive and its, most, its impact is most... Uh, uh, most noticeable for the poorer countries because the poorer countries depend so much more on the corporate income tax. And I want to flag up something that several of the Conservative Party candidates have in the past made it quite clear that their goal is to abolish the corporate income tax. Now, in this country, it's not a particularly large, it's an important but not a particularly large source of income. In many other countries, it is. But it is a key backstop to protecting the personal income tax because all wealthy people will use corporate structures to, to hold their wealth. Abolish the corporate income tax and we can say goodbye to income tax generally. And at that stage, where are we with democracy? The second bunch of termites, and again, look at Britain's role here. Um, yes, Britain isn't actually there listed, but look at its territories. These are the places which provide what I describe as a criminogenic environment. These are the places that enable um, uh, uh, um, kleptocrats and crooks and fraudsters and all sorts of people to hide their money offshore and in many cases to reroute their money out of a country, hide it behind a corporate structure and bring it back as foreign direct investment. Now for anyone who knows anything about the IMF and the World Bank, their, their project is all, as far as they're concerned, all about encouraging foreign direct investment. But when you talk to them and say, as I've done over many year, years, decades now, and say, OK, well, what do you mean by foreign direct investment? Because your statistics are completely misleading. A vast proportion of the foreign direct investment into India, for example, or China, comes from Mauritius and British Virgin Islands, respectively. In fact, we're talking about Indian capital has been moved offshore to Mauritius and comes back dressed up as foreign direct investment. This investment is neither foreign, nor direct, nor investment. Because in so many cases... <laughs> in so many cases, actually, it's, it's, it is domestic capital that's coming back with all... attracting all the tax breaks and other treatment, but, treatments, but it's not investing in new job-creating activity. By and large, it's engaging in mergers and acquisitions, uh, and creating rent-seeking monopolies, as we've seen in Britain. Uh, and Britain, I think, is one of the prime examples of so much British capital moved offshore in the 60s, 70s and 80s and has now come back onshore as predatory rent-seeking capital. And the third set, and, 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 and if, goodness me, the Panama Papers really reveal this. The Panama Papers, the biggest crooks of all, are in fact the lawyers and the accounting firms, and the banks, and the entire enabling environment. Uh, I, I did a, a, a research progress project recently. I wrote a paper uh, after interviewing um, a whole load of uh, many international accountants, and it's quite clear that their attitudes are, in so many respects, anti-democratic and very, very criminal. They see absolutely no uh, problem with um, pu putting together packages to enable their clients to evade, avoid, abuse tax, and or a whole range of other um, criminal activities. So I think we've got to address the problems they, they, they pose for us. Um, in addressing that, we have to recognise that internationally, and this goes, this goes back to the Bretton Woods settlement, there is an, an institutional gap, a failure, because the, the problem is that all the, or so many of the rules here are set not by a democratic global institution like the UN, there is no UN tax authority. Instead, it's set by the OECD, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. And here we have a problem because that's the think tank of the rich countries. They set the rules. And since the 1950s and 60s, they have set the rules absolutely completely to benefit the interests of the richest capital exporting countries. Um, and, and therein lies the problem. Um, and the sums involved are absolutely massive. That's just the volume of private wealth held offshore tax evading. And that is very much the lower end of the spectrum. Um, and, 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 and all this has been part of what you were talking about, um, which, which is the ability of capital now to shape the rules totally to their advantage. 
um, and, and we have, don't even have the institutional framework to address the issue. However, <laughs> we all need some hope, particularly at this, this stage uh, of the afternoon. There's a lot we can and have done. Um, first of all, and Britain, I think, can lead the way here, we have been promising, in fact, former Prime Minister David Cameron, who knows all about tax havens, let's face it, <laughs> promised full disclosure of ultimate beneficial ownership of companies and trusts on public registries. Strangely, when it was inserted as an amendment into the Financial Services Bill earlier this year, that bill was spiked by the Prime Minister. But I'm sure that John and others within his team will be bringing that back. Require full disclosure to Parliament of all corporate tax exemptions, reliefs, holidays, etc., with detailed cost-benefit analysis. I'd like to see that happen in every country in the world. We have something like 1,400 of these reliefs for corporate entities, costing us something of the order of 119 billion, according to the National Audit Office. Well, I don't know about you, but I, I could think of a lot of very good ways of spending 100, 119 billion. <laughs> New health service for starters. Um, we need to develop. That's it. I'm finishing an, an international financial reporting standard on tax reporting for use by all multinational companies. Good news is we had a meeting in London at the Institute of the, the Institute of Cost. Sorry, what am I talking about? The Chartered Institute of Chartered, Chartered Accountants of England and Wales. Um, yes, just yesterday to get precisely that project underway. And I think that would be absolutely a radical transformation of the way in which we all uh, can understand how multinational companies operate within our respective uh, economies. We need, and this was mentioned earlier, I think Jayati, you mentioned this, we need to recognize that the existing rules for, for taxing multinational companies, which dominate the global economy now, those rules completely broken, the base erosion profit shifting project of the OECD has failed, RIP. Now let's move on to unitary taxation uh, and, 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 and ICRIC, which uh, and, uh, serves on, it has developed exactly that, the, the model for that. And, and I'd like Britain, which for many, many years, Britain has been blocking at, mainly at European uh, community level, but also at OECD level, has been blocking progress in this direction. I would like to see Britain cease to be a blocker state and become a state that cooperates with moving in this direction. And finally, at the level of international development and, and cooperation and solidarity with other countries, let's see more Britain engage actively with the United Nations Development Programme OECD initiative called Tax Inspectors Without Borders, which is designed precisely and has been do doing fantastic work helping some of the poorer countries push back against the predatory tax practices of the multinational companies. That's it. Fantastic. Thanks so much, John, for those five very helpful proposals for dealing with three horrible termites. I think we've had a lot of very evocative imagery during this session and certainly <laughs> lots of really, really exciting ideas. So now it's over to you. We'll have to be quite quick, but if I could have a first round of questions, so I'll take um, the person in the green top, the person in the blue shirt, and a uh, person in the middle there with a pink, pink t-shirt. It's brilliant. It's great. So if you could please ask questions and not make statements, that would be really fabulous. <laughs> right. Hi, I'm Alison McGarry. I'm from Islington North CLP. And the missing factor for me in a very useful day has been the role of trade unions internationally. Uh, I work with 800 transport unions across the globe. And in terms of um, global trade and global finance, they play a key role. What do you see as their strategic leverage in supporting the type of policies that you've been pushing forward. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Yeah. Hi, hello. I'm Russell. I'm, I'm Vice Chair of the Society of Labour Lawyers. Um, so um, the, the, thank you very much for a really fascinating uh, discussion today. It's been really interesting. Um, I think for me, the missing point is, is kind of Brexit. Because if we leave the EU, as soon as we do that, or shortly after, all the financial regulation that applies and has been developed in the EU, whether you think it's gone far enough or not, it's certainly uh, more developed than uh, most, quite most of the rest of the world, arguably, um, covering things from, you know, since the financial crisis, the capital, re um, capital requirements regulation, MIFID II, AFMD, Shareholders' Rights Directive, uh, Solvency II, the list goes on and on and on. 
all of that the Tories can uh, remove um, after Brexit. Um, so, so, you know, what, what, what do you think about, um, you know, that problem? Idil Mohammed, um, my question is, I guess, mainly addressed to Daniela. Um, I worked at the OECD on uh, fin uh, financing for development for quite a while, so I'm aware of all of the can of worms surrounding that issue. And when you said remain and reform for a country like the UK, which is um, the crux, for me, the crux of the problem is lack of accountability. When you see the discussions that are taking place, people on the table, who, who's on the table? It's um, the, the inst inst institutional investors from these countries, and there's lots of vested interests, and we are representing that. So if our citizens are not aware of what's been done in their name, um, and this is the key problem. So if we remain on reform, um, we're just saying that it's up to us. Why are we not having this discussion openly um, with countries in the global south who are not um, at the table? And I guess um, the last person who spoke was um, spoke to that as well, the problem of these institutions. Brilliant. Thank, Thank you very much. So just to recap that round, so how can trade unions help with this? Isn't this all contingent on our membership of the EU? And how can we increase accountability, particularly with countries in the global south? Um, who wants to go first? Daniela, maybe given okay. the, the last question, we'll start it to you. OK, so very quickly, I'm sorry, the lady from the trade unions has left, but I think the Wall Street has, yes, she has, <laughs> unless I can misremember her blouse. Uh, Yes, excellent. So, yeah. so I think uh, the, the Wall Street consensus and the project of maximizing finance for development is an attack on uh, the role of the state as a provider of public services and it's the push for privatization of any public service you can think of, a push for, for the privatization of education, health, anything you can think of, and a push for creating public-private partnerships where the state guarantees profits for the private sector, basically, and for, for institutional investors. So to my mind, trade unions have to be there from the beginning to, under, to, to to diagnose the problem well, to try to get to the table and to resist at the, at the level of country in the global south and to create coalitions across countries in the global south in order to resist the, the, the push for PPPs. I, I was quite kind of skeptical about the importance of PPPs, but if you look at the, at the documents that the World Bank is producing, the, the one for uh, Egypt was incidentally financed by the, by the British government, it is a proposal to privatize uh, and, and I think I will disagree a bit with my panelists. Uh, the, the state market distinction disappears because in the Wall Street consensus, they don't care if it's state-owned. They don't care if energy companies are state-owned as long as they are moved to the market in terms of financing, as, as long as they, they work according to the rules of the market. So you can have lots of state-owned companies, you can have a state development bank, and it will still do the job that the Wall Street consensus imagines for the de-risking state. Uh, why, how, how can we have this conversation? Well, I'm, I'm working and trying to work with civil society organizations in order to bring uh, governments and civil society actors and trade unions at the table. I would say that the Global South is also, and this is a political issue, there are governments in the Global South, and I'm thinking Argentina, who was in charge of the G20 last year under Macri government, which is a right-wing government. Argentina was pushing very much for this uh, Wall Street consensus and for this infrastructure as an asset class. So it's a, it's a complicated political question of who do you talk to in the global south in terms of, uh, in terms of political alliances, but it's very important. Yes, I agree. Great. Thank you, Daniela. Um, Anne, is there anything you'd like to... Yeah, just on Omar's point, um, you know, I quite agree with you about Brexit and, and what it's going to do. I think people have misunderstood. They, they think of Brexit as this complicated trade issue and about Article 24B and C and so on. It's not about that at all. It's about aligning Britain with, with the, United, the, the United States and in particular with the globalized, financialized United States. And the question is, we have to choose which side we're on, you know. And there are states like Argentina right now, like Bolsonaro, that would prefer to align themselves with Trump and those that would prefer not to. And, you know, we on the left have to understand that is the issue at stake here. It's not about whether or not you want to be in Europe or out of Europe. It's about whether or not you want to be subordinate to the United States and in particular to a kleptocratic United States. So that's why I'm very much um, skeptical as I am of much of EU policy, of course, and of the weakness of the, of the, of the architecture of the EU, which, believe me, has to not just be reformed but transformed. Nevertheless, I, I, I have argued from the beginning for political reasons that we should remain. Thank you.
Quick comment on the on the role of trade unions. You know, uh, I can give you an example from India. Uh, in India, we have a very strong, vibrant trade union movement, particularly in the banking sector, and uh, that has played quite an important role. And uh, we started liberalisation in the 1990s, early 1990s. Since then, the successive Indian governments have tried to dismantle the public banking. Uh, and they wanted to privatize, hand it over to foreign investors or even domestic investors. But the only resistance so far has come from the trade unions. And the advantage with the trade unions is that, you know, because they are the ones who run these banks, you know, and they have so much information. In fact, they have uh, shared so much information that how the bank loans are, are, are being misused and politically and the corruption and things like that. So I think the trade unions uh, have, to, have to play a much bigger role uh, uh, as far as uh, uh, finance is concerned. My only concern is whenever I interact with the Indian trade unions or even other trade unions who are active on the financial sector, they tend to have a much more uh, nationalistic uh, framework, you know and the kind of uh, global alliances and, uh, and, and, and the outreach which is required, that is missing. At, and I think this is the high time because the finance has gone global, you know, yeah. whereas the trade unions, by, uh, some trade unions essentially think of policy solutions within the national uh, jurisdiction framework. So I think that it's, it's a big challenge for the trade unions also to, to how to address the global financial issues while fighting their battles at the national level. Quick word about why trade unions really need to engage on the areas of, of transparency, multinational transparency and so on, help, help us to push for more transparent uh, environment. Since the 1970s, I've been discussing with trade unions the problems they have when they enter negotiations at national level with the ability of, of um, multinational companies to shift their profits offshore and to, to present profit, uh, uh, um, profit uh, and loss accounts showing losses in the, in the nation state wherever they're operating, saying we are consistently making losses here in Britain. Um, our profits are actually be arising in Luxembourg um, and, uh, and in Cayman Islands. And this inability to actually find out for, where profits are arising and how and to be able to negotiate with accurate information about what profits are being generated here or in India or wherever because you're constantly be being presented with rubbish information but um, is a major blockage and therefore trade unions need to play a very very active role in helping us to shape new accounting rules uh, across the world. On the issue of Brexit, I think it's, you know, I'm currently working on a, on a documentary with a New Zealand team who are asking a very simple question. Why is Liam Fox, our trade minister, down in New Zealand so much of the time trying to negotiate a new financial services deal under the so-called progressive comprehensive trans-Pacific um, partnership? And the reason he's down there is, should, I think, give us some indication of what the post-Brexit goal is. It's a highly deregulated mm. financial services market. It's a, it's a, and, and what they want there is a, something of a Trojan horse. Once they've negotiated that one, they want to replicate it across the world. Mm. And I, I think we need to be paying a lot of attention to what they're doing in, on the other side of the planet in negotiating deals with, with, which, which will open up markets, not just in the trans-Pacific area, but eventually it will serve as the model for what they want in an utterly deregulated financial services market. Thank you very, very much. And I wish that I could have another set of questions, but I've had people waving at me saying, okay, come on, that's the end of the session because we need to move on to workshops.